Good day, folks. So good to be here with you again this week. This uh, week here in central Alberta near Edmonton, it's been the last couple of days have been so beautiful with the sun shining and the temperatures uh, rising enough to make it quite comfortable and beautiful for us here. And I hope wherever you are that you also are blessed and that uh, in some way, some form, uh, God has uh, given you great joy and pleasure in his presence. Today we're here again to uh, open up our Bibles and to take a look at the Word of God and see what God's uh, message is for us today. And I, I pray this will be a great blessing to you as well. Thank you so much for inviting me into your homes on the road or in an airplane or wherever you're hearing this or even watching it possibly. And I thank you so much for your patience and your kindness and all this too. So I was reading an article this past week by Greg Morse. In that particular article, he provides his readers a, a well-balanced and a fair analysis of the modern day household. And Morris uh, presents this uh, contrasting the difference between a pre-industrial revolution household and a post-industrial revolution household. Now, I won't be using the whole article, and of course he is not as comprehensive as he probably wants to be, but he brings out some good points that I want to begin our time with today. But Morris also has a reason for writing his article. He's writing in response to a New York Times article reporting on the impact on working mothers forced by the pandemic that we've been going through uh, to leave the workplace to care for their children. And the Times calling the pandemic-driven child car, uh, care crisis, as that's what they would say, is a woman's burden to bear. And the Times is arguing uh, that these women forced to stay home and care for their children not only lost their paycheck, but their autonomy and self-sufficiency as well. And the time goes on to describe that this initial shock as the months dragged on turned into an increased feeling of despair at the loss of their professional careers. An increased disappointment and feeling of unfairness as they had no choice in all of it. Now Morris is clear that his goal was not to malign any woman or take away any of the stresses due to the loss. Matter of fact, Morris writes, quote, their loss is greater than they suppose, and it includes us all, for it includes the household. And this brings us back to the Industrial Revolution. If you're wondering, that occurred approximately at the end of the 1700s to the end of the 1800s, about 100 years. And prior to the Industrial Revolution, um, women in the household, we could say from a Christian perspective, reflected in varying degrees the Proverbs 31 woman. Now, that's not to say that this is not happening in our 21st century modern world. But Morris makes an interesting point about the Proverbs 31 woman when he asks this question, was she a stay-at-home mother or a working woman? He answers with one simple word, yes. She was an industrious and productive woman. This woman, according to Proverbs, raised their, her children in the instruction of the Lord. She contributed to the needs and support of the poor in her community. She ran a home-based business selling garments and linens. She sought out and she purchased land. She planned and planted vineyards and gardens. She gathered and brought the necessary food items into the household. She labored for her family in the home. She prepared for the various seasons, even in the winter, providing clothes for the winter. She labored with her husband. The question is, was she a stay-at-home mother or a working woman? Yes. This woman's duties to her family required her contribution to the production for the home. Morris refers back to the Times articles that describes the aversion of women forced to stay home and care for their children because of the pandemic. And they quote one of these women, quote, I love everything about motherhood and yet it doesn't feel fair that I should have to sacrifice 
my career. In response, Morris writes, quote, we can hear in their complaint a groan that the household is not what it is supposed to be. Their productivity, the ingenuity, the purposefulness for all members no longer exists as it once did within the household. Now, just to be clear, to be fair to Morris, he's not uh, prescribing that we should go back to the pre-industrial age. He's not saying that in his article, but he makes a valid point here. I, I would venture to agree with him on this. Because all these things change drastically because of the Industrial Revolution. We, we might not think about that in these days. And what happened is work left the home, and along with it went the father. Education left the home and went to the schools. Uh, the grandparents and single, singles moved out of the home to live their own separate lives. Care of the elderly and the sick left the home to the institutions. So basically what Morris uh, is suggesting here is that the household was outsourced. We see that in a lot of ways this way in business and in, in, in large corporations. They outsource a lot of their work. So basically people emptied out of the home, productivity left, and as Morris suggests, much of the purpose as well. And as we would already mentioned, what was the result? Well, the father left and spent most of his time away from the home. The heir of the family business, usually the son, but not always, went to playing videos and planning his own future. The daughter went from, prepare, for, from prepared to be, preparing to be married, learning from her mother, building a household with her family, to being trained away from the home. And the elderly who once were honored and cared for have become mostly forgotten. And that is certainly true in our culture today in the West, simply uh, forgotten in many ways. And singles now are on their own, away from the families and living life alone. And the orphan and the widows become dependent, the needy become dependent on the state for their very existence. So keeping this in mind, let's turn now to, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, we'll be reading from verse 14 down to 16, just a few verses. Chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by the angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you so much to uh, be here with you. You have drawn us together by your spirit. You have called us to worship you in this way with the uh, understanding and reading and teaching of the plain good truth of God. So we ask you, Spirit, to help us understand, and may you be uh, glorified in all these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have called our current sermon series, What is the Church? And hopefully, as we have gone through 1 Timothy verse by verse, we have gained a better understanding of God's design and purpose for His church and our place in it. But for today, let's take the word is from the sentence, what is the church, and place it at the end of the sentence. Now we have this sentence, what the church is. We no longer have a question. Here's the point. Verse 14 to 15 is, comma, what the church is. Hopefully that made sense. Or as one commentator put it, quote, how God sees the church. Now, before we focus a little closer on the text, some background work would be helpful. We should remember, as I've mentioned it a few times, we've mentioned it together, the setting of 1 Timothy is located in a first century context. And when we consider the household of Paul's day, of course, we should keep in mind that this was before the late 1790s, uh, the, the time of the beginning of the Industrial Age. And the household was very different than today. 
Now, I want to give a credit where credit is due. Uh, I, use, I am using the Holman New Testament commentary to provide some of the information that we're going to be dealing with regarding first century households. So now, if we were to take a trip in time, back in time to the first century household, you would really find a diverse household. There you would have, of course, the parents, that you would have their children. You would include the extended family, uh, also the workers involved in the household, and what we would call the stewards or the steward of the house. So essentially, the first century household was a representation on a very small scale of the society as a whole, a very effective representation. Because in the household, you would find a variety of age groups. You would find the female and the male genders. You would find different responsibilities and duties and roles. And overseeing the household, we would have the master of the household who was responsible, responsible for the leadership and the order, the peace, even to oversee the education of the family including the religious education, any other social uh, education, all these things. And the stewards of the household, they were responsible to manage the, the many aspects of the household. We, we see this in chapter 39 of Genesis, where we find there in that story, Joseph living in the house of Potiphar, who became his steward with the responsibility of the household and all that Potiphar owned. So it's through this lens and context of the first century household that Paul said, I am writing you these instructions so that I am, if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. These are verse 14 and 15 of our text today. So please consider with me this phrase, God's household. And right out of the gate, we should never understand this, see this, or know this, as a reference to a building, a structure, a location, or even to what we would call today a denomination. We remember that Paul's understanding of a household would not include our Western, modern-day, individualistic and consumerist approach to a household, to our culture, and even sometimes and often to the church. We should also remember that Paul was not writing to an unbeliever. He was writing to Timothy. And Paul was addressing, through Timothy, the issues occurring at a church with believers in Ephesus, that Timothy was the pastor and elder and leader. Therefore, God's household is Paul, what Paul would call is the family of believers as he describes them in, Gal in the Galatian letter, chapter 6, verse 10. Or as the writer of Hebrews said, Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house. See, the church, according to Paul and the writer of Hebrews, is the family of believers made up of men and women, uh, all age groups, adults, children, in between, all sorts of work experience, professionals, laborers, business people, etc., etc. Uh, a variety of dynamic possible uh, gifts and all sorts of talents. And all these cared for and guided by those that we can call stewards, that is the elders, the pastors, the deacons, responsible to their master and our master in the church, Jesus Christ. Remember earlier we said what the church is. We changed that. That is... Notice the phrase now in verse 15 with me, which is the church of the living God. So now let's drop another word out of here, which, and add God's household. So God's household is the church of the living God. Friends, God not only created the church, the church is God's dear possession. The apostle Peter reminds us of this when he said, you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not the people, but now you are the people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's in his first letter, second chapter. 
Friends, the church is the chosen people of God, God's special possession, who declare the praises of God, who saved them from darkness, and now live in his light. Mercy was given, and mercy was received. Or as Paul said to Titus regarding Jesus Christ, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify a people for himself that are his very own, and they're eager to do what is good. See, the household is like no other group of people, no other institution, no other club, no other anything. Why? Well, because of the one who is called the living God. We go to Paul in his second letter to the Corinthian church, and Paul was concerned that some in the church were associating to, together so closely with unbelievers that the, their influence would be harmful to the believer's faith. And he writes, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, he's not saying, don't be with unbelievers. Don't be yoked. Don't be uh, so connected with them that it will affect your faith in Christ. And now we don't have no time to unpack this. Uh, so here's the point. The church, my friends, is not a club. It's not something you attend weekly and pay your dues. It's not for members only, or a certain group of people, or a certain color of skin, or a certain social and economical, economic uh, relationship. It's certainly not a religion with all its trinkets and bells and whistles and ceremonies and idols. And it's not some ideology or human philosophy or social construct or some sort of uh, political identity. No, it's none of those. It's not even necessarily a set of doctrines. The church is where the chosen people of God meet to worship what Paul calls the living God. Or what the Jeremiah the prophet said, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. Earlier in this letter that we have been studying verse by verse, chapter 1, verse 3, Paul said to Timothy, stay in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. So Paul, here through Timothy, exhorting, commanding the Ephesian church to pure doctrine, and now, here in this particular part of his letter, he adds the call to a pure people. We get this sense when we see this phrase in verse 16, true godliness. But please notice the phrase, the pillar and foundation of the truth. This is where uh, holiness and purity comes from. The pillar and foundation of the truth. This is what the church is. This is where one finds the people of God transformed by the truth of the gospel, by the true uh, word of God. This word in this particular phrase, foundation, appears only here in the New Testament. It's quite interesting because this is a reference to a foundation which a building is rested upon. And the church, my friends, is responsible to guard and proclaim this truth of God and to live out the claims it teaches. Paul said to the Ephesian believers <clears throat> that believers are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. And in him, that is Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises up to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you are being built together. We could say joined together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. You know, there's so much more that we could do with this Ephesian text. That would be for another day, another time. Especially, though, considering the spread of something more deadly than any plague that we have ever encountered in human history. And this is the plague of false teachers and false teaching and false worship. So let's just keep this very simple. The core and central uh, beliefs of, and practice of Christianity is found in the authoritative word of the Bible. And the true church of God protects the truth from falsehood. For the church is, as Paul describes, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Well, friends, verse 14 and 15 reveals 
As a commentator put it, how God sees the church and how we live as a church. And now verse 16 is how Christ relates to the church. But let's deal with this word here briefly, the word mystery. We see that in the text here. When you hear the word mystery, what is the first thing that pops into your mind? Give it a thought. Mystery. What pops in? Maybe something that can't be explained or unknown, something ambiguous or ambiguous or confusing. Marbles in the mouth again. Or something of a, some sort of mysterious quality or character. Well, John Stott in his commentary will help us guide uh, is guide us here in this situation. This mystery Paul is referring to are the truth which we now today we know today because God in his will and purpose has revealed them to us. You know, this is vitally important for us to understand in our current Christian context, especially here in the West. Paul said to the Roman believers in his letter, now to him who is, this, is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message that I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden in ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. That's in the 16th chapter of Romans. You can find it there in verse 25 and following. The Canadian pastor, Tim Chalice, in his article, Seven False Teachers in the Church Today, includes in his list a prophet who claims the gift to speak fresh revelation from God outside the Bible. And this would be a new and authoritative word from God, words of teaching, encouragement possibly, rebuke, prophecy. And Chalice said this about these prophets, such prophets like these. Quote, he is commissioned, this prophet, and, or prophets, and empowered by Satan for the purpose of misleading and disrupting Christ's church. We should be very familiar with what John warns us in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 1, where John said, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, for, but to test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now think about this. This was written in the first century. We are now many centuries removed, and this has not changed. Friends, when you open the pages of the Bible and read the words in the Bible in your own language, God is speaking to you and revealing what he once kept hidden. You step outside the Bible, away from the Bible, and you will find yourself in a minefield of false teaching from all sorts of so-called Christian teachers or people that say they represent the church. You know, I've been to those places in the world, sadly, where one step in the wrong direction and your friend will hear the will hear and see and smell the explosion, but you won't have any ears to hear with. And maybe, just maybe, they will be able to find enough of you to send home to your family for a burial. Friends, it's the same with your faith. One step toward the minefield of false teachers and their teaching may lead to another step and another step, and then finally, boom. And there won't be enough of God's truth to be found in you to send home to your family. The writer to the Hebrews said, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Friends, the mystery has been revealed in all its fullness by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
From this revelation of Christ springs, as Paul would, would say, true godliness. True godliness and a holy life is found only in and through Christ. God and godliness, as the commentator put it, were revealed to all people when God became flesh. As we look at the rest of verse 16, starting with, He appeared in the flesh. This may have been a first century hymn used in their public worship. But one commentator explains it this way. This is a confession on the mystery of godliness. And this is a helpful way to understand this part of verse 16. In the same way as the Apostle Creed or the Nicene Creed helps us to put the words, to put two words, the essentials of our Christian faith. Well, in summary, the Apostle Paul calls each of us to pay close attention very close attention to the high calling of the church. The church founded by Christ, built by Christ, for Christ. Paul calls us to pay attention to the foundation on which the church was built and remains so to this day. The apostles and the prophets that with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Paul calls us to pay attention to the Bible for the church is to guard the truth, proclaim the truth, and live out the truth it proclaims. To pro guard the truth, proclaim the truth, and live out the truth it proclaims. And this is the truth that will change a life, a community, a country, and a world. Because as 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, Quote, long ago I ceased to count heads. Truth is usually in the minority in this evil world. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your message to us. Thank you, Lord, for your dear possession, the church. And thank you for calling us and saving us and placing us in the church, not only in our local church, but the church around the world which is a representation of your kingdom in this world. Thank you for your word, for it is the truth of God as it reveals it. Thank you, Lord, for our leaders, our elders, our pastors, those who are genuinely interested in each one of us, who care for us, who tend for us, who protect us as a shepherd would protect a flock. Thank you for those who stand for the truth of the gospel against a world that does not want to hear it. And thank you, for, Lord, for preserving us against those agents that would come into the church and cause discord and dysfunction and animosity and hatred. Thank you, Lord, that when you see us, you see us through the lens of your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise you and thank you. Give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything. Shalom.